Oh, right. Man. Wow. So 2020, once again, never ceases to amaze me. Whenever you're hearing this, people, we're right before a hurricane in Houston, and I don't know if we made it or not. If we didn't, you know what I'm saying? Hey. It we is all, what it is. Yeah, we always record a little bit earlier, like a week, maybe two weeks in advance. And so far, it I was going to say it hasn't been a problem, but it is. Like, we did a recording literally right before everything shut down for Corona. Yeah. We're like, ah, ha, 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 I don't know what's about to happen next. <laughs> literally, the episode comes out, it's like everything is shut down. Yeah. So we're doing this recording. Uh in, in light of our last situation, we're just going to say, hey, we hope everybody's safe. We Man. hope that the whole thing just blew through. We hope it was nothing. Like, I hope I just got off of work for a few days for nothing, and it was just, that was it. That's I what I'm hoping. God, man. I pray. That's what I'm hoping. Yeah, because 2020, once again, never ceases to amaze me. But the NBA is good. Oh, the NBA is fantastic. Yeah. The NBA is, is is so much better than I thought it would be. And it's it's it, a lot of people are popping out that I did not think we would be talking about right now, including my – I mean, look, the Rockets are my team, and James Harden is playing defense. And James Harden me, is playing defense. They have told me for the last – all his career that James Harden does not know how to play defense. Yeah. That's what they've been telling me. And apparently he can, and when he does, everybody else does. So I, I don't, I don't know. It, you know, who know, who knows what's happening right now? Twenty twenty is it's surprises. It's surprises. Everything's up for grabs. Everything is up for grabs. But you know, that's the thing about twenty twenty. You don't know what can happen. We don't know what can happen in twenty twenty one. Hopefully, in this year, all the bad things end, and we can like. 2021, we could redeem ourselves. I'm hoping so. I'll be redeemed. And our next guest knows a lot about redemption. Redemption is the action of saving or being saved from sin, error, or evil. Not saying this man's evil, because he's not. The man's changed his life. He's a band leader by choice and plays numerous intru- instruments like the trombone, piano, and also he sings. He's a Houston legend, yes. We don't throw around that term loosely. This man's been around for a minute. He's used to legend alongside alongside Bun B, Paul Wall, Bushwick Bill, ESG, Scarface, to name a few. An entrepreneur who bet on himself and he won. Pasadena's own Henry Dara, also known as Doc Loke, with the EP in stores right now, What Can I Say? Not to mention everything else <laughs> that you could find on him. Right, we just want to make sure we got Henry D. We got the name right. We got Doc. Yeah. Doc, say say your name again. Doc Loke. Doc Loke for the people, because like you were saying, how do people like to pronounce it? Doc Locke. <laughs> it's, it's literally it, it it rhymes, yeah. so they just kind of immediately go for. That's how I was saying. I was like, oh, Doc Locke. Well, they almost. They might also look at me and my unassuming look and say, "This, this ain't no loke. Why are you calling yourself a loke? You ain't no so loke. Came from the suburbs, you know. Yeah. You ain't got no loke history." Yeah, that's true. Well, uh, you know what? You have an interesting history. You got a. Uh, I mean, this go runs the gamut. So let's go back, like way, 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 way back, and let's just talk. We'll just start from the beginning. Uh, where were you born? Pasadena, Texas. Pasadena, Texas. All right. So uh, for people that have not been to Pasadena, Texas, uh, just let us know. <laughs> As he lets out the side. What yeah. is Pasadena, Texas like? Well, everybody's got to be from somewhere. And there are <laughs> lots of lots of rednecks in <laughs> Pasadena, Texas. Used to be the capital of the Klan. Uh-huh. The, the Klan. And um, so that's where I grew up in, with a lot of a uh, lot of shut minds. And um, I didn't grow up seeing uh, people of color. Um, there were the Coles when I made it to high school. The Coles. It was it was two sisters and a brother. Oh wow! And that, that's that's the environment I grew up in. 
Oh, wow. Okay. okay. Yeah. It didn't start integrating until the 2000s. Really? Yeah. Yep. Yep. So when I, when I got out of TDC, I saw, I actually cried. When I got home, I, I saw, it feels weird to say, but it's the truth. I saw black people walking around in my, like in my area that I grew up in. And I just, I, I, I literally cried because I was like, how, how did this happen? Yeah. Because yeah, yeah. Before you went, and you said when you got out of TDC, we're gonna get to that point. But you had been removed from Pasadena for for a minute. So, right. I, I mean, let's talk about leading up. I mean, just gr well, you know what? Before we even get there, growing up, were you inclined towards music? I I didn't have a choice really. My mom is a singer songwriter. Um, she plays guitar and uh, sings and and plays piano. Uh, I'm the secular music musician in the family. All her music is for Jesus. So I, I grew up in the church. I grew up in choir, singing in the choir, and um, I always had a piano. And and I was I had a gift of the ear that I get from her, and from my grandmother on my dad's side. Uh -huh. So I, you know, music came from God. And I, uh, you know, fortunately I was allowed to be in band. That's where my musical instruction started at at age 11. Oh, okay. And I started on the trombone. I, I played piano, you know, self-taught, real bad habits. And um, But that's, I, I was encouraged by my family. They never said, don't do music. So music has always been just a big part of, of what's going on in the family. But you said you're the, uh, the secular uh, musician in the family. What right. music were you listening to? Because you had to be, I know your mom is listening to one thing and playing one thing for you. But... What are your influences coming from? Well, th yeah, I guess, I, yeah, their influences, because we found the records. We really, me and my, they being, um, you know, my parents, but me and my sister really loved the Beatles and uh, found a George Benson album, okay. you know. Um, so they had a wide variety of stuff, a lot of hippy dippy stuff, although they weren't like hippies, but, uh, a lot, you know, a lot of music of the 60s and 70s, lots of James Taylor, um, you know. I mean, uh, not that it's a bad thing. I made a bad face. I just no, no. <laughs> you just got tired of listening to him all the time. But I I can recall my first. I think it was three or four tapes. I'll remember as I start naming them off. In 1986, uh, I got to to buy my first my music and um, Tiffany. Um, so I was go ahead and start with her. Come out strong. Bon Jovi, Slippery When Wet, yeah. Cinderella. So I got this this chick singer, you know, and and these two uh, hair metal bands. But my saving grace is License to Kill by the Beastie Boys. Awesome. Ah, okay, okay. Is License to Kill? License to Ill. License to Ill. Exactly. We're gonna correct you. And, yeah. <laughs> is but I do like Bon Jovi though. But just throwing that out there. That's just me. Cause yeah, we're we're talking about rock and and pop. The, is License to Ill your introduction into hip hop, or yes. were you hearing stuff before? It? Okay, so License to Ill, that's your. That experience. was it. That was the introduction. That was it. Oh, okay. It my, yeah. And, and you hear that, and then you're thinking, like, where do your where do your musical style start to go from there? Well, uh, so that was fifth grade. When I got to sixth grade, um, I actually heard N.W.A. for the first time on the playground. You know, somebody had a radio and they're playing this. It blew my mind. I was like, what? Oh, my God, what is this? I can't, you know, I can't dare get a copy of this and bring this to my house. <laughs> you remember what um, song? Do I? You remember what song it was? It w it wasn't even, a, it wasn't, it was more of a skit that, that. Okay. That, that busts out. And I can't, I can't say it. Yeah. Yeah, I, know the I won't say it. It's a yeah. word that I won't say, but it had to do with the. Uh, it was a police officer skit. We're gonna kill this bitch, mm -hmm. and um, and I was like, "What in the? What is this?" Yeah. <laughs> and so, from license to ill, uh, license to ill, you're saying fifth grade, and then Beastie Boys. I'm sorry, uh, and then NWA. Yeah. Right. Yeah, almost directly, year. directly after that. Now. Right. Uh, then what, where are your musical tastes, uh, kind of going as you, uh, continue? Well, I really like The Cure, um, you know, the, you know, it's the eighties. So on the radio, it's not like now with all these d divisions, the, 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 
the 93Q, which is now rock and I'm sorry, it's not not rock. Um, it's it's a country station in Houston. Yeah. It was a it was a pop station, but the pop would be like this wide variety of popular music because they didn't know where to put hip hop, and you know it it, it was. It, I, I got to hear all these different things on the radio, like The Cure, and um, uh, I'm I'm trying to think of who who I liked a lot. Um, uh, Depeche Mode, you know, the, it was the '80s, so yeah. I, I liked all these different things, and and a lot of people liked Metallica, and 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 you could still like Public Enemy and these other things, and um, Run D, uh, not Run, well Run DMC for sure, but um, Young MC. Um, okay. And um, and that's that's one of those things where I think people just either they forget or they just never knew. Like there was a point where they weren't playing hip hop like that all the time on the radio. It, there wasn't a hip hop station. I remember right. we were living in San Antonio, and my they had hip hop playing on stations here in Houston. We didn't hear it. No, like we never heard it unless my cousins came and visited, and then they mm. were like, oh. Y'all should listen to this. Yeah. Like play this. And I was like, I've never heard any of this. I, I was listening to Aerosmith. So I, mean, Aerosmith. I was literally like, that's what like Aerosmith, they play this Anita song Baker. 400 times a day. Aerosmith <laughs> and Anita Baker. That's Wham. what I was listening to. I love Wham still to this day because of that. Like, oh yeah. Man, George Michael, come on. Yeah. That's yeah. that's literally all we were hearing. Right, right. So right. as you're uh, continuing, so eventually, and you already alluded to it when you were talking about uh, TDC, what what happens? What what gets you to that point? Well, um, you know, to be honest, and this is a forum to be honest, something happened to me when I was a child that I, uh, you know, I wanted to self-medicate and music did it at first. Oh. I practiced music compulsively. I was always competitive. I was always the top trombone player in junior high. And uh, when I got to high school, I started drinking alcohol, um, alcoholically. I, I drank some in junior high, but um, when I was at the band parties after the football games, everybody had an older brother. The upperclassmen had, you know, we all alcohol was real easy to get a hold of. And I found that I could get self-esteem by drinking more than these older kids because I was a little bean pole, like barely a hundred pounds, you know, wet. Ah. And and I would drink these older guys under the table. And, and, and that started a progression that the alcohol wasn't enough. When I discovered marijuana when I was 16, I thought it was the secret to the universe. I thought I found the key. <laughs> yeah. And then I started going to clubs in Houston. Um, my friend had a fake ID and I had a car. It was a perfect, you know, a perfect team. Mm -hmm. And I started doing psychedelic drugs, started doing acid and ecstasy. And I really, really, ecstasy was kind of expensive. And I realized, well, if I sell it, I can get high for free. I, I'm not like totally not listening to Ice Cube and I didn't listen to enough to NWA. And yeah. I I was getting high off my own supply from the very supply. beginning. <laughs> from the very beginning. From the oh. beginning. I was a terrible dope dealer. Just <laughs> terrible. Now is being a terrible dope dealer, is that what got you arrested? Yes. So so what happened? Some snits brought an undercover into my apartment, and I thought the deal was with someone else. I was so high, I didn't, I, I, I didn't realize it was this cokehead that I didn't like. Ah. And uh, he brought in undercover, and I still let him in. And I had these three sheets of acid, and I had a half a sheet in my wallet, and uh, three different kinds. And they, you know, I showed him the acid, and. They kicked door my apartment, and I, I didn't have any gloves on. If you know anything about LSD, you should probably wear gloves unless you want to trip. And I put it in an envelope, and me not really thinking clearly, I stuffed the envelope into my mouth because I was going to get out of this somehow. You know, forget that I have 57 hits in my wallet. And I, I do thank God for the cop that noticed that I wasn't talking, and he choked me and got me to spit that out. So I did not go to jail first. I went to the hospital. Oh wow! Yeah. So you took right. everything that was in the you took everything that was in the envelope and just tried three hundred hits of acid. Most of the time on acid, people take a one hit or more. They don't take three hundred unless they want to spend the rest of their life in a mental institution. Okay. Oh and the cop choking you 
<laughs> like to get you to, to vomit is what yes. got everything out. Yes. And, and fortunately, you know, in that, um, you know, I, it didn't hit me. Um, it's grace that I didn't, uh, you know, that I'm here and that I didn't wind up in a, in a mental institution. Oh. Well, I mean, I did go to a mental institution, but that's, a, that's another story. <laughs> We're going to get to that. that story too. We'll get to that later. <laughs> <laughs> so, you, uh, how long were you in a TDC? I did a little under two years on a 10. Uh, I did probation first because um, we got a, got a lawyer and I got 10 years uh, deferred. Um, and I, I got two DWIs in. Uh, I'm, the first one I was two years in and I got divorced my first uh, marriage. And then a year later, I got a second DWI. And, and then that's why I got a 10 year sentence uh, back oh, in wow. 2001. So. Okay, so that's 01. How long, and, and you wound up staying, at, I mean, did you fill out, was it the full sentence or just part? No, I made my first parole. Um, I, okay. I hung out with some writ writers. I used to listen to the prison show with Ray Hill a lot. I don't know if y'all know Ray on 90, 90.1 FM. Is, we do. Uh, yeah, Ray, so Ray actually changed, got the law changed. Um, they call it the Ray Hill Bill. In Texas, once the time is served, when off parole or you know, day for day, we can get registered to vote again. A lot of a lot of wow. states in the nation disenfranchise people, um, and and once you get that felony, you can't vote again. Yeah, but in Texas, it's different. And and fortunately, I made my first parole. I got out of um, out of prison. I skated for a while, and then uh, last time I got high, and um, you know, was the day before December eighteenth, oh three, December ninth. 1903 was my last drink. So I've, I've been clean and sober for 16 and a half years. Oh, wow. I remember when I met you, you told me that I was drinking and I was like, hey, you want to drink? And he was like, no, man, I've been sober. And I was like, <laughs> yo, I, I was telling my brother, I was like, yo, I felt so bad because I'm over here. Like, oh, no, no, no. <laughs> you, yeah, you, but you told me not to feel bad. Now. That's the first thing come out of my mouth. That's like, I could just say, no, thank you. Yeah. I'm good. Yeah. I've had enough. Yeah. You were, no, you were cool about it. He was like, don't feel bad, dude. And then we continued our conversation. I continued drinking. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That's right. I didn't feel bad. I was like, right. Okay, good, 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 good. <laughs> you know, looking back, uh, you're talking about, uh, you said December, what was the date again? 19th. December 19th. What was it about that day or, or, or that point in your life where you're like, you oh, know, man. I'm, I'm done. I'm just going to stop. That, that, that week, actually, I, I, um, I, I used to play at a wine bar um, and uh, I played a gig. And then um, they I actually back in, in that, that time period, I actually got a percentage of the, the bar and I got paid. Uh, it had like unlimited alcohol and we got paid. So it was like a, just a perfect situation for an alcoholic. And um, I ended up going to. Uh oh. All right, so it was the perfect situation for an alcoholic. I was getting paid in alcohol, percentage of the bar, and then uh, money. And so I went out after that. I was already lit, and I went to Fitzgerald's. It was uh, it was punk rock night, and I remember vaguely talking to somebody about Los Carnales, and I gave my keys up. And next thing I know, I'm wake up in the Heights, and I don't know anybody in in the house. I don't have keys. I don't. It was it was dude. Where's my car? And um, I uh, I got a I, I borrowed a car somehow. Someone trusted me with their car. I borrowed a keyboard because I had a gig the next night. This was a Thursday. That night, I got paid in cash. And um, you know I I I I hate tweakers and I don't like crystal meth. I prefer cocaine. So I can because I could go to sleep on cocaine. But there was none available, so I did crystal meth. That's my last drug I did on wow. Thursday, December eighteenth. The next day. After being up all night, I had uh, I had like a beer over in Hyde Park in the Montrose, and um, and uh, somebody somebody called me that I didn't like. Uh, we both liked the same gal. Um, he didn't drink anymore. He asked me if I wanted to to go hang out, and um, and uh, you know I had spent some time 
uh, my second half of prison, I, I was I was clean and sober, you know, um, and so I knew, you know, something about it. Um, but that that was the turning point. It was uh, it was fear really that got me, uh, you know, clean and sober. At, you know, that was enough at the beginning. The fear of what? Yeah. Fear of what the fuck was going to happen next. Oh man. Mm. I, I mean, I ha I was out of control. I had no, con I, I was just going to drink two when I got out. I was going to be like, my dad's a non-alcoholic, loves beer, drinks two beers a day, and that's it. And I, I thought I wanted to try and do that. I'm not wired that way. The first time I tried to drink two out of prison, I drank six. Uh -huh. And I wasn't going to smoke dope until March 19th, 2011, because that's the day I got on parole. I was going to wait to get high, like eight something years. So I was getting high about eight weeks later. You know, and then and then the lines get crossed. I'm only only doing this, and then I'm only going to do this, and it it just you know I'm I'm a drug addict and an alcoholic, and I don't I don't have the power of choice. Some people do. Ah, so you just gave it up completely, cold. Yeah, I squared up, man. I'm, I'm my drug of choice now is caffeine. I feel that. Again, yeah, that's interesting because they always say uh, uh, there are a lot of alcoholics or addicts that kind of move over into they take that alcoholic habit or that addiction and they apply it to other stuff like they'll say oh i do caffeine yeah. i mean we we have a close personal friend of ours that was an alcoholic and switched over into working out and now he's like right. this is my drug like this is right. what i do now and it gives me that high so what uh, was there anything like that in your life that you kind of moved over to uh Bluebell, I, I really like you. <laughs> you don't look really, like it really, at all. I really, you know, I, be, I believe in God and all, but Bluebell was my higher power, you know? <laughs> um, I, can, I can take it down and, um, uh, you know, I, I like gambling. I, I still, you know, I, that's one of the things you're not supposed to do in prison, not by rules, but if you want to get in a fight, you gamble. Um, oh. And I did. And fortunately, I, you know, I, I avoided fights. Um, but uh, I, you know, um, and then there's the whole sex thing. That's that is also a <laughs> that's so so you, you didn't move into exact. I mean, basically other carnal pleasures, but I mean other well, right. Well, it's that dopamine hit. I'm gonna get yeah. the dopamine somehow. Ah, uh, yeah. What's your bluebell flavor? Well, um, mint chocolate chip is 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 a is a is a favorite of addicts. I like also Wait. like. Uh, what peanut butter and chocolate you know to get chocolate ice cream and then add i like adding peanut butter to a lot of things wait, 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 hold up hold up mint chocolate chip <laughs> is a fl is is like a flavor for addicts i'm telling you 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 find a, a drug addict and ask them their ice cream flavor a lot of them are going to say mint chocolate chip <laughs> mint chocolate my chip is, right mint chocolate chip is my favorite ice cream yeah. Followed by, followed by peanut butter. Like, if it's chocolate and peanut butter and stuff, so I don't know. Maybe I, you know what? Thank you for warning me. <laughs> 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 so cool. you're, you're now out, you're sober. Uh, when did you start, uh, you had this, you know, rich musical background with your family. Uh, right. Did you immediately start getting back into it? Or did you just kind of ease away from it? I, wh what was your feelings about music when you got out? When I got out, I, I, I hooked up with a lot of underground cats, uh, like playing um, with uh, down-tempo DJs, like uh, playing with Rebel Crew and mm -hmm. Solar Grooves and, and playing with DJs. Um, and that's what I did a lot. Actually, I had a friend um, who he just got out of state jail and we had a lot of like the kind of getting used this is before sober but it, it leads into you know i i went right back to music ah. but um when i got sober um i started doing like pro, pro gigs again because i um uh, went to one of my old teachers and and uh you know my story was was pretty uh, uh well known um in the community and um and uh, you know, I, I told him what I was doing, and and I, I started working again. Um, and I started working as a pianist, and I turned pro in '94 when I I got out of high school. I started college. I started doing gigs like at Astroworld. Y'all remember 
with the, you know, this little Dixieland with the funny hat and the red bow tie playing at the, like, holiday in the park and oh, stuff yeah. like that. Yeah. I used to do that and then play uh, tuxedo gigs, like high society stuff. And, you know, that's the thing, man. That was my dream was to, to be a musician and to specifically play jazz. Um, Cause I was turned on to that. That's the part I left off um, in junior high. I had uh, jazz trombone. Uh, I was taught classical, but all of my guys from seventh grade on could improvise and, and turn me on to, to all the, all the classics like JJ Johnson and, even Glenn Miller going back earlier, but um, you know, I, I I was introduced to jazz at age twelve. And so. uh, you know, you, I was reading when I was reading uh, a lot of your bio information. You talk about being so attracted to jazz, even though you're learning all of this classical stuff. Uh, what what attracted you to just jazz in general? The freedom, you know, the the creativity. I mean, I love classical orchestral music, but you know, although it can be interpreted in different ways, it's 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 going to be the same thing, um, essentially. Uh, I I don't play autumn leaves the same way every time. You know, if I play a standard, uh, I, I I get to improvise. You know, mm -hmm. that that's what it is the the creativity of improvisation. Uh, Did is a lot of what attracted you are was there any elements of jazz that also attracted you to hip hop because we, oh. we discovered you from what you were doing in Houston hip hop realm yes. so yeah can you expound on that yes um i mean as soon as you say that i think a tribe called quest and and they're you know they're sampling miles davis and and the the uh the early um I, I think of, of the creativity in, in hip hop with um, uh, freestyling um, and and rhythm. You know, the, the rhythm is 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 one of the most appealing things about um, about rap music. Um, in particular, what about Houston hip hop? Because you've done some. I mean, you do uh, some covers are. I don't know, what would you call them covers of hip hop songs? I don't know if you'd necessarily call these covers. They're well, they're, they're fully thought out mu musical pieces. Yeah, inspired by. They're covers, but uh, transcriptions. Um, if, 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 uh, if someone really knows the song, if you listen to the melody, um, so I took rhythmic dictation of the rhyme and then took that rhythm and created a melody based upon the chord structure which is usually two or three chords, you know, repeating um, uh, chords. And uh, that way the heads can, can listen to this instrumental and know, oh, wow, that's, he knows all the verses to, to want to be a baller. They're doing this, everything. That's, oh, that's Hawk going there. Okay, that's Youngstar. Yeah. Uh, not, not just, okay, these are jazz musicians improvising something, you know, or doing like what the, you know, not knocking what people have done uh, I'm not the first one that like the cover. Well, they just do the hook. That's true. And then you know, like with 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 um, you know, with marching bands, you know, they 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 might play it, but they, uh, to my knowledge, no one transcribed the rhythm and made a melody because that that bridges the gap to a whole nother audience that doesn't like rap. It doesn't yeah. know what 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 the pillars of hip hop are. I think that's interesting. You're saying that because yeah, you do hear that on. Uh, your like your transcription of "Want to Be a Baller," uh, especially on like like my block, mm -hmm. on my block Scarface sample. It's you hear yeah. it start up and the intro. It sounds exactly like on my block. Yes, perfect. And then when the rapping is supposed to start, it's like a whole new musical piece. Like <laughs> you yeah. literally see like all of these uh, artists. If you know when we show the video. You see these artists doing their their version of what they would hear on the song. Right. Uh, what were your thoughts when? Well, actually, let's go back because first of all, your name, Doc Lope. Where do you get that from? Well, I I do have a doctorate in music from the Moore School of Music at uh, okay. University of Houston. So that's the doctor part, and it's uh, not that it's important, but it's a DMA. A lot of people say T PhD. T I almost said THC. That's something else. <laughs> PhD, 
Um, but it's it's more of a performance space. I got a, a, a doctorate in conducting with the emphasis in jazz. So the love part, I already talked about prison, talked about being a bad dope dealer that got caught, did time, got out, got sober. So my buddies from Fifth Ward um, call me Henny Loke. Ah, so okay. I loked out. So I took the loke part of of that part of who I am, and and then the dot part of who I also am. So, and then for our audience that that's going to be looking you up, and what we're showing is your group is Doc Loke and the Swingers. Who are the Swingers? Right. Well, this so I got that double meaning because of um, you know swing this in the jazz tradition swing. Swang, hmm. swang, swangers. So th oh. they're my swangers. And then also got the, you know, got the elbows, got those, uh, you know, someday I'm going to get, get some of them. <laughs> I, 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 figure, I turned 44 this year. I figure I can be tipping on fofos all year. That's true. So I'm working on it. That's working true. On it. You're already tipping on fofos at 44. I'm so about to say 44. <laughs> that's yeah. perfect. So <laughs> What what inspired? I mean, how did you find these guys? And then what was your 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 thought initially? Like you're like, hey, I want to show these Houston classics uh, to people in a different kind of way. Like, what was your pitch to these guys? Or were they always in? Like, yo, when are we gonna do this? Well, I, I didn't I didn't have to really pitch it. I I mean, because it's a gig. They you know they're they're paid for everything they do to rehearse, to record, to, to perform all, these are all pros. So oh, that's where they right. came. Many of them are top call jazz guys, but there's also some uh, classical, classical musicians. And I, I, I don't want to leave out, they're mostly, mostly dudes, but uh, my berry player, Grace Estrada is um, a, a gangster on the Barry's tone saxophone. She plays other, um, um, uh, uh, other reed instruments. I met her at the University of Houston. Many of those cats are uh, University of Houston uh, related. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, but if I back up to the conception, um, uh, the first person that I, I told my idea to was Dan Workman, um, who is my co-producer. Dan, who used to own Sugar Hill for so long. Um, mm. And uh, and before that, though, one of the things I have to give credit, I didn't just come this out of thin air. Uh, Jason Moran, um, PVA grad, um, you know, world world traveler, yeah. cold piano player and amazing musician, came to U of H one time with a, he had a, the, the little Sony uh, mini disc recorder and he played this woman speaking Mandarin in, a, in an airport that he had recorded her. And then he just started playing along and he's playing the rhythm. He has no idea what she's saying, but he creates the soundscape based upon the rhythm. And I was like, okay, I, I took that, and and uh, and and then that's that's where I got the idea to, to do the rhythmic dictation of these rap rap songs. And um, and one of the things too is, uh, you know, from a practical standpoint, I have a couple of jazz albums that predate this. And nobody really buys jazz. <laughs> okay. Okay. So this was more, this is also like, hey, let me start to reach out into other markets. And it's almost like, like, like I will say, your transcriptions are not just, it doesn't sound like a cover. It's very, there are so many elements of jazz. It's almost like you're bringing hip hop people and you're showing them, hey, I, I can also do this as well. Right. Right. That's also connected you with a number of Houston artists. We've seen you perform with uh, Scarface. Uh, no, I. Okay. That's a dream. I haven't. Oh, that's haven't a dream. With, you. Okay. I, I had. I. I was. Was well. I don't have direct contact. I've never met Scarface. I know he's aware of the project because I was. I was asked to put together a group to play for his birthday party like okay, this a couple years back. It didn't a, happen, but I did not have direct contact with Face. I did volunteer um, and I voted for him because I'm in his district, um, but I voted for him for city council. Yeah. <laughs> that's well, that's, close a, <laughs> I was about to say, so that's a word out. So that is a dream to play with Scarface, like play Absolutely. background Scarface. But it can happen, Starface. I was about to say, it, you know, it, it can still happen. You did play 
with uh, Bushwick Bill. Yes, um, I, I have. Uh, I had the opportunity to to get him on a track, um, and uh, that was one of the. Uh, it was a real special ex experience getting to record with him because I had met him a couple of times at Sugar Hill, mm -hmm. and I was up there um, mixing the ESG track that. Um, it's not released yet, but I, I did Swangin' and Bangin', recorded that with the big band. Okay. And uh, E came in, um, my wife sang a hook on it, like she sang something, you know, some some background stuff. And um, we were mixing it, so E wasn't there. And and uh, Bushwick comes in looking for his producer. And I had already, um, I had I'd already recorded uh, Hung Up on My Baby yeah. uh, for, for a documentary. And because they couldn't get the rights for, um from from rap a lot you know they didn't have the the, the bread um you know to pay for rights to use uh mind playing tricks on me so I, I did the whole song so i already had the master of it that was part of my payment on that deal and when i met 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 bushwick like the for on a business sense i, I just took my shot and i i pulled together some money that i didn't have and and the way it came about just told me it was the right thing because i i, I you know I raised a couple thousand dollars in, in, in less than two days. And, um, you know, and I know he was doing stuff for free and, and I was told by someone that he would probably, you know, just do it, but that didn't sit right with me. Um, and, uh, and, 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 and so again, coming from this jazz background, I'm expecting to show up at the studio. Okay. 12 o'clock. We're going to go in, we're going to start recording and then we're going to, get in and it's going to get out and I showed up I was real 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 nervous <laughs> real <laughs> nervous and and I go in I, I see Bill and he's like you got a car I'm like uh oh yeah and he's like okay he gets his backpack and um and and so we go on an adventure um because at the time you know, he had for those who don't know he he had pancreatic cancer and he had chemo portable chemo which I'd never even heard of nor seen and so he's sick from this poison that, you know, is, is fighting the cancer. And he has me take him to the clinic. Oh, wow. And, 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 and he won't wear a seatbelt. He's telling me how, that, that was the funniest thing part, because he's trying to tell me how he's been in all these car accidents and how he knows how to fly out of cars or some kind of, some, some, some crazy. <laughs> I'm like, I, what am I going to do? Say, oh, okay, uh, Mr. Bushwick, would you, please put, you know, I don't want to get pulled over and get a ticket, you know, and so, so yeah. we're, we're, we're riding around Houston. And then we, when we went to, a, our, you know, I hope this isn't, you know, we went to IRS hearing. Well, he did it because he's taking care of his business. Yeah. He's getting everything. He's getting his affairs in order. Yeah. So three hours later, when we're back at the studio, I no longer feel nervous. I, I learned a lot about the man that I didn't know. And I felt like his buddy. <laughs> Oh wow! Yeah. And and I'm gonna say there's a couple of famous rappers that have passed the joint to me. Bill being one of them, and I thought about it. <laughs> Be like, <laughs> this is once in a lifetime opportunity. But you still managed to maintain because I was about yeah. to say, still working in music. Uh, I mean, like you said, there's uh, very early on in your career. There's a lot of drugs and alcohol that are around how do you yeah, yeah i mean how, how do you maintain your sobriety uh, you know it's uh the not i mean it's not a cliche but it's one day at a time one moment at a time and uh you know i i give thanks to my higher power you know it's um i i didn't do this on my own i made a decision but you know i mentioned words like god and jesus and grace and that's that's what saved me is, is, uh, uh, you know, some, some people ask, uh, for proof of God, you know, and say, there's no proof of God. And, and I say, um, you know, skinny white boy for me with no affiliations can go through the prison system without getting into a fight. Tell me there's no God. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> That's true. I was about to say, so what, what are some of the other things that we can expect, uh, from Doc Lock and the Swingers, like what? I mean, I know things are are different right now. You guys are. Yeah. I, I would always see 
performances or things like that from you guys. And now, you right. know, with the virus, things are kind of shut down. But what are our plans now for the future? Well, um, I'm writing the second album, you know, so that's that's important to, uh, you know, I'm, I'm doing that. I, I'd already had other tracks that I, I, I've been working on. Um, and uh, so so composing the music is, is paramount. Um, we do have a gig with Paul Wall at, at Discovery Green in June of 2021. We were we were going to play uh, with him, um, yeah. you know. This, that, yeah, that's that, what I remember. I, it was one of the things I was looking forward to trying to go to. And then, of course, Rona. Yeah. Oh, Rona. So that got pushed to next summer. Next summer, yeah. Okay, okay. So, Paul Wall, are, what, what Houston artists are, uh, of course, Scarface, but are there artists that music you're like, I really want to transcribe this? You, we, you've talked about Scarface. You've talked about ESG, reworking some of that stuff. But what are some of the songs or things like that that you're like, yo, this is what I really like to try out? Well, I, I don't want to forget that, that we worked with Bun. Um, and oh, I, I, I got to do, you know, and I did put his draped up on, on the, uh, you know, the original release, Doc Lope and the Swingers. Um, but then I trans, you know, I got the opportunity to, to play at the Museum of Fine Arts. Um, and, uh, and then we did uh, two songs with him. Um, I'd like to work with Bun more. I'd, I'd like to do, you know, if, if he's open, I'd, I'd do a whole album of his stuff. And I mean, the, uh, um one of the songs um uh i'd, I'd like to do knocking doors down from, from, oh, from wow. yeah uh, i already had the piano i mean the piano part is pretty simple but i've started that um uh still pimping pins i'd love to work with kiki i actually talked to him at a record store day and i asked him you know i bought the record and and I said, which which one of these would you want to, you know, because because at the time he had already uh, done Southside with the Suffers. So I wasn't going to do Southside again. Yeah. Um, but, you know, Pimp and Pins, it, it, it's unique in that it's one of the few songs that, that DJ Screw actually raps on. Yeah. And and so I, I want to finish that one. Uh, Knocking Doors Down. Um, uh, I, I, that was always one of my my favorites. Um which is hard to say with so many great uh, rappers in town. Um, I want to do K Reno. Um, yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. Because because a lot. I mean, you, not everybody knows. Yeah, about and he K. has Reno, such, but, I mean, he has such a huge catalog yeah. that yeah. a lot of people don't, like. You just have to know it. Like if you know yeah. it, you know it. And I feel like anybody that gets exposed to his music is is. I feel like it's up. When I got exposed to him, it was how come I didn't hear this before? Yeah, like yeah. like he's been doing this for how long? And yeah. I I never and I heard him a while ago. Like it was a long like the first time I heard him, I was like, oh, he has how many albums already? Right. And and he still continues to release consistently every yeah. year. So yeah, that 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 yeah, that's a Houston legend. Right. And then also another kind of overlooked uh, Devin the Dude. Um, oh, of course, of course. And uh, I, I, uh, you know, when I think of Kay Reno. I think of Conscious Cats. Um, one of my dear friends who passed away. Um, I want to do a song by Zen, uh, Wally Akeem. Um, he started. Well, he he was one of the people who started a, um, a all real radio over in Third Ward. Really. And, um, and he's a, you know, I, that's one. Of, he's one of my biggest influences, and nobody even knows who he is because he's a Ooh. conscious guy. Um, and it's, um, you know, uh, 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 let's see if I can remember. I thought hip hop was a state of mind, not just a punch punchline. Would somebody hip rewind? I mean, that's the song I want to do, and 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 it's going to be the one that nobody. You know, it's going to be more deep cuts than, you know, what Absolutely. was played on the box. Absolutely. And then speaking of what was also not played on the box, I want to do a Trey song. Oh, yeah. 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 And yeah, Zero speaking song. Of, speaking of what's not played on the box. Like Absolutely. It. Absolutely. Because he has plenty of stuff that could be getting played right now. Yeah. Right. right. I went to his re re uh, listening party um after uh, Nipsey passed, um, mm -hmm. that and uh, and listen to that. That was 
that was an experience um, being there. And I, what, what's his name? Uh, I could see his face. I'm trying. It was one of these like Graham, uh, you know, famous guys. And I mean, he's a actor and a rapper and uh, Gilly. Um, I, I got to meet him at that. And I, I just, I went total like fan, ah. you know, I got my picture with him and he was like so cool. And I was like, yeah. and then I met, met Willie D. I was like, man, this is a fucking party. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. So, I mean, you've done, uh, uh, you've done a lot working within um, Houston and, and you've talked about, you know, how you want to get more music and things like that and more appearances out there. How can your fans and your future fans find you? Like, where should they go look to see uh, where they can find out the new information about you? Well, I think Instagram. And I do have a website, but I, I don't update it much. I, you know, I'm the one that controls it. So I do have DocLokeInTheSwingers.com, uh, but that's a good place to go for the links to uh, uh, the uh, uh, I was gonna uh, share yeah, your Instagram. Instagram. Yeah. So you've got Doc Loke and the Swingers, and of course we uh, you You're gonna uh, follow back, right? You got uh, YouTube. We follow you all. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. The funny thing is, and this is a number. This is a big question for people. They'd be like, "Hey, are you uh, you gonna uh, follow us?" And I was like, "It's funny. Our page only follows us." I said, "We're already following you." Like yeah. I said, my page, Dr. Douglas. His page, Avery Zadius. I was like, how do I constantly you? repost you? Yes. So, yeah. I was like, and how do you think gone. we know? Like, we're sitting up here liking and following. And usually, though, it's funny. It'll be like, we'll interview somebody. And months later, they'll be like, oh, this is you? Yeah. And I was like, yeah, yeah, that, that, that's us. I said, I follow, we don't even really be on our page. We be over here. I follow <laughs> you. I follow your other page. I follow yes. your wife. Like, right, I, right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I constantly, I was saying, hey, like, we, we be out here, but but before even even going further, you sing as well, correct? Oh, yeah. I do, yeah. How long have you been singing? All my life. Like I said, I can remember the first first gig I had was at church singing Little Drummer Boy when I was, like, five. Oh, wow. Um, and by, by gig, I mean an unpaid gig. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah. It's, uh, you know, but church, but I got experience. Paid. Yeah. yeah, we we all work for free in church. Yeah. So <laughs> that's basically what it is. Like that's your first gig. I like that. Yeah. Yeah. And uh and I uh, really got into singing. It, it was Harry Connick Jr. He's one of my big influences. Um You could tell uh, when 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 Harry Met Sally came out, that soundtrack with the big band, because I'd listened to old timey big band, but I hadn't heard a mon modern big band swing swing like that and um uh, and i just started you know i'm singing to girls and singing those songs and yeah it works is that it, your wife she was actually looking for a pianist and uh she 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 came um and and found me and it ended up turning into a date and um was, we've done some gigs together but um anyhow <laughs> shout out to melissa she's a uh, She's pretty cool. Oh, okay. okay. Music changed your life all for the better. Yeah, mostly. mostly. <laughs> well, I mean, this is this is a you know I'm not gonna come in and say everything's cool. I, we are separated. You know, yeah. 2020 is now a, a slang, not a slang, but a more of a cur curse word. Oh, sorry. To I feel like that, that, that's how it is for a lot of people now. 2020 it is, is yeah. a big year of changes. Yeah, but but in you know in the bad there's always good and I you know keep my head up and and uh, grinding and and uh, you know if if I'm not with you know with her I'm you know it gives me a chance to work on me yeah and, and music and and a lot of other things it's not you know and that's life. a great thing about your story it involved just in your life in general in music you have figured out how to find these bright spots in these kind of moments of darkness and just flip it around. Like, so even, you know, when you're telling us a story, uh, you're very optimistic for going back and telling us like all these things that have happened to you where you're like, hey, I was in TDC and I made it through. 
<laughs> you right. know, just saying like, I can look back and I can see the good things that are occurring. And so, you know, we, we're, we're happy that you came out. Uh, I still don't understand how Bluebell is your vice and you're still skinny. But oh no, not now. No. <laughs> we were trying, I'm not skinny, but um, I uh, no, I, I Bluebell is no longer my 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 go to. Oh, okay, okay. I was like, how are you eating all this Bluebell? I said, you're, you're, you know, you know, no, not at 44, <laughs> at 24, maybe, but not, no, not now. What's your go to now? That's a, that's a good question. It's, it's coffee. There you go. Coffee. coffee. Well, coffee will keep you slim. All right. You're drinking that right now. He said, <laughs> going for the cup. Going for the cup. Oh, man. man. Thank you once again. Yeah, for coming out. It was great. Another Houston legend that we had with us today. Um, in my humble opinion, podcast and Doc Loke just letting us know that no matter what you do in life, if you choose to change, you can change. And he did. So once again, I am Avery, like a very nice guy, also known as Avery Zadius. And we have our co-host with us, Jess Devon. Boom. Jess Devon. And we've been here with Doc Loke of Doc Loke and the Swingers. Also, Henry Dara. Dara. Dara, see, yeah, I, I, knew, I knew that. Yeah, I, that's, why, that's why I was calling him Henry D, because I was like, I'm going to mess this up. Because uh, you said Daria, and I want to call you Henry Daria. Yeah, I no, I say I dare you to forget how to There we go. I dare Henry. you to forget. Like O'Hara. Henry Dara. He gave yeah. us so many ways to say it, and I still fucked it up. Either but, way. So people need to know, Henry Dara, and it's Doc Loke, not Doc Locke. Don't yeah. say Doc Lock. Say Doc Lope. There no, you go. <laughs> Once again, in my humble opinion, where the opinions are humbled and the words aren't jumbled. Thank you. And good night. Bang.